Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Holden, I'm an alcoholic. We love you, Holden. Lots and lots and lots. How much? Oh. Oh. Yeah. Thank y'all so much. Um, if y'all don't mind, um, I'd like to just do the serenity prayer real quick. Um, that it's okay with everybody. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Thank you all. Um, yeah, so um, appreciate the introduction, Latham. It's, uh, it was a really cool experience for me as it tends to be when these kind of things happen, um, to meet somebody and really discover that not necessarily the world as a whole, but especially the AA world is very, very small. And um, I find more and more that with even just the smallest amount of effort, you know, sometimes just showing up, you can get some pretty amazing rewards. Um and uh, a lot of that, a lot of time that comes in the form of um, realizing that, that you share the same ideas or that you might have certain teachers that you, you both follow. Um, and when you both do that somewhat blindly, um, you know, say if it's a speaker that you both like and you've never even met this person yet, you, you can sit there and have an interesting conversation as if you were talking about a philosopher or you know, that, that is a cool experience for me. And um, before, it was an experience that I could really only get um, when I was sitting at a bar stool and I was really trying w- whatever. Um, I was trying the hardest that I could not to feel alone in the world. And I would really stretch um, in order to, to find an association with somebody. Um, now... I find that all I have to do is show up and be honest and um, a little bit willing. And all of a sudden, I, I get this entire world, you know, as a um, as a reward. And it's uh, it's it's something I truly don't deserve, um, you know. But I um, I'm very grateful for it. So, um, and with that said, uh, I live in Nashville. Um, I'm currently. Uh, I, just moved a couple months ago from uh, a town called Lebanon to to East Nashville. Um, my, my home group was the IBI UBU group in Lebanon, um, but now I'm with the Young Timers group at Club 62 there in, in Nashville. Um, if any of you guys come up to Nashville, please uh, look it up, grab my number before before we before we depart, and I'll uh, make sure it's a, it's a great meeting. We have um, a lot of really great people up there. Um, so um, I am. I have three siblings. I was born in Macon, Georgia, in 1980, and um, you know I'm a middle-class family. I had absolutely every opportunity for success, um, and you know, pretty standard 80s living. You know, if you ask me, um, very typical household. Two parents that worked very hard. Um, father ran a um, a music business, a uh, like a you know piano and organ store, and um, you know in our family you know basically we thrived um, on you know the success of that business. My mother was the accountant for the business, so you know it was um, it was a lot of work on their behalf, um, and so I found myself you know there in the store a lot, and um, you know. I'm, Got a lot of really cool stuff as a as a result of that, you know. And music is a is a big part of my life, and 
it's part of my story too, both positively and negatively. But um, you know, that that's just a result of my my upbringing and and and, and where I grew up. Um, I don't remember that much good stuff about my childhood. Um, you know, when somebody said that they just assumed they went insane 30 seconds after they were born, I get that. Um, because the, the idea that, that the alcohol caused me to be this way, uh, you know, I, I can't relate to that. Because uh, uh, I remember being this way. Well, I don't ever remember not being this way. Um, there's all kinds of behavior from when I was young that, that really demonstrates this. Um, when I was maybe six, five, um, you know, I stole um, my mother's tennis bracelet, um, you know, just with all different types of diamonds and gave it to a girl, I think, in first grade. <laughs> And you know it was it is funny and it's an interesting story, but I also think it it really details um, a couple different ideas that I somehow had when I was younger. One, I alone am certainly not enough for this relationship or this interaction between the two of us, and so I'm going to need to bring something to the table, Um, and. Two, I'm probably not going to work for it. I'm probably just going to take it. And, you know, um, and then three, and probably most importantly, is I need you, you know, to to give me value, you know, in my life. Um, I don't know how I got those ideas, and I don't know, um, you know, why me and not my brother who... Same household, two years apart, you know, really um, the exact same upbringing, you know, and he he has none of these characteristics. He's he's peaceful, um, he's tactical, he's sane in every way, shape, or form, and completely uh, reasonable when it comes to things like dealing with alcohol and drugs, you know. So um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know. you know, I was born this way, and for the longest time, it really mattered to me why. Why me? Why me? Why me? You know? Um, so, yeah, I was a messed up little kid. I don't think externally, other than some of this, this acting out, could you really tell? Um, but I knew. I knew there was something going on, and we talk about it a lot around here, right? Like, that feeling of... You know, being um, on the outside looking in, you know, I'm, I'm comparing my insides to your outsides, and I'm losing every single time. And, you know, can I address it? You know, address it. I, I'm afraid to even tell people about it because, um, you know, I don't want it to get worse. And if you guys think I'm weird, because if I tell you how I'm really feeling you know, I'm going to feel even more alienated and then it's going to get even worse. Um, Moving beyond, you know, the adolescent years into high school, you know, this behavior became more and more entrenched in my life. Um, You know, relationships became um, my first drug of choice. And it was a very substantial part of my life. Now, I got a lot of really, really good um, effects from these relationships. I learned a lot of positive things. Um, but I also learned some things that, um, you know, would end up really, really, well, like the big book says, you know, um, turning on me and tearing me to shreds. It was um, these ideas of, you know, like manipulation um you know the um say so, you know there's active forms of alcoholism the dishonesty um you know it baffles me um sometimes still today in recovery how easy it is for me to lie um i don't know i don't know why that is um it comes naturally to me 
And that is a horrible thing to say. Um, but I, given the option of telling you the truth right now on, on something that doesn't even matter, you know, the lie comes easier to me than the truth. And it took a long time um, for that to catch up to me. And now in recovery, it still takes a lot of conscious effort to remain um, to remain honest, especially to myself. But I've got help for that, you know, with you guys. So I'm, you know, on this high school gig, you know, and I'm living in that alien world um, where, you know, we judge ourselves by this success and that, and um, and internally. You know, I'm not doing too hot. You know, um, I'm I'm basically living day to day on the status of um, whichever relationship I was in. I was in, I think, three, you know, for high school, long-term relationships within the four years of high school, and um, they came back to back. And um, you know, if if things were good in the relationship, I was good. I was good. I had meaning. I had a purpose, and um, and I had peace. But if there was even the perception on my part that things were not good, if things were not okay, then I was not okay. And I was, I was out there manipulating the world, trying to arrange the play to ensure that even if you didn't, things didn't okay, didn't get okay and you weren't, um, if I wasn't becoming the apple of your eye again, all I had to do was think that you were. And then I was going to be okay again. You know, my whole life internally was dependent on outside things. And I thought that's how it was supposed to be. And I didn't know any other way. At the same time, I was doing some pretty cool stuff. Um, I, you know, I was still, um, I, I also had, you know, music talent. Um, I, um, I actually moved my senior year to Chicago. Um, within, from, elementary school all the way up through um, high school, um, I was following my mom up the corporate ladder. My parents divorced um, when I was about eight or nine years old, and from there on out, we were moving every two years um, as she you know, successfully was climbing the ladder, and, and I was along for the ride. Um, it really uh, taught me a couple other things, or at least it gave me the opportunity to have a, um, a clean start every two years. And if you are an alcoholic like I am, there's nothing better than a clean start every two years. Because it was about every two years that, you know, that the bed's starting to unravel, right? Some of the lies are starting to conflict. Some of the things are starting to happen. And I'm starting to get found out. So it's time to, to move. Um, I was playing a senior year. I moved to um, Chicago. I was um, I was on the the junior national um, Olympic volleyball team, and um, that was um, a, a very healthy part of my life. And um, you know, I got to travel and do a lot of different things. Um, you know, and I think from the outside, I think a lot of people would have said, and they did say, you know, what a talented kid. He's got so much potential. And, um, you know, I can't state enough how I had absolutely everything handed to me, you know. Um, all I had to do was, you know, show up to school, do the work, um, you know, at, at just the most basic level. Um, I didn't have to work hard in school. I, I really didn't. If I did, I wouldn't have made it through. Um, but I made it through pretty well and I, it just it just that's something that comes naturally to me. Um, people always wanted to praise me for that and I never understood that because um, like I said it, it wasn't difficult. Um, I was looking at other people who were doing things that I considered to be exceptional and saying uh, those are the people that deserve praise. I was looking at people who were doing things like not going to college and starting either their own business or doing something on a volunteer aspect, and I was saying, wow, that's somebody I respect. That's, that's, that takes a lot of guts, um, because I was way too afraid to do something daring like that. Um, so I did, you know, what was expected. I went to, I went to college, and um, 
right before I went to college, my senior year of uh, high school, um, is when I first discovered um, a relief for the condition that I knew as life, um, but now I know, now know is, is alcoholism. Um, you know, and, um, you know, drugs do play a part of my story, um, a pretty significant part, but um, I don't think we really have to hone in on, on the substance itself. The, the, the thing that matters is, you know, I found the solution. You know, I found the escape from from my brain and my um, my internal disaster. You know, that unending tension that's with me from the minute I wake up to the second I go to sleep every day, and that had me on the edge of my seat at all times. Um, and I found I found something that relieved that, and thank God I did. Um, I went to college um, in Washington, D.C., and um, life started to get better. Um, one, because I became a, um, a, a you know, a, a highly, um, I guess, a highly functional pothead, and um, and I was a happy kid, man. So it, you know, if you medicate me effectively, I can go out in the world and I can function, you know at a pretty high clip and be pretty happy doing it. Um, and, and, and these years um, are really, really summarized well by, by that, you know. Um, I, was, I was in D.C., I was doing the college deal, um, and, um, you know, I, that was probably my I have arrived moment because um, for the first time, I just, I wasn't a ball of tension all the time, you know. Given the alternative, you know, to stay in this feeling of anxiety and tension versus doing a little bit of this, so what if it's illegal, so what if it's unhealthy or this or that, I mean, I'm always going to choose this. You know, I'm always going to take the route of not being so because I can't continue to live this way. And like I said, I have no doubt in my mind that if I wouldn't have discovered um, some substances that would relieve the tension, that I would have committed suicide a long time ago. Um, I think it was junior year of college. So I played volleyball freshman year. Keeps you real busy, keeps you real. Um, it's very difficult to drink a lot and be, you know, a Division One athlete. Um, I'm sure it can be done, but I just didn't have the need for it. I, I did not play any longer moving forward. Um, it was getting in the way of um, a smoking pot and hanging out, you know, and um, that's what I like to do, you know, because for the first time I had friends, you know, not just not just people I went to school with and not just, but, but people who, you know, we, we, we were developing a life together. You know, we had, we had a click. We had things we did on a regular basis without actually arranging it. You know, these were things that were foreign to me and things that I see a lot of people have well before their college years. But for me, you know, like I said, it was my I had arrived moment. Um, but by sophomore year, we were going to more parties, and with more parties, it wasn't my first drink, but I do remember the first drunk. And I do remember looking up at the sky in the backyard of this row house in the Georgetown area of Washington, D.C., looking up and saying, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> this, this, is, this is what, you know, this is what I'm talking about. You know, because I talked better, she looked better, we traveled faster from party to party, and we did what we did on a daily basis, but with more gusto. You know, and I, it's like, it's like the color that had been lacking in my life was there, man. And, you know, not a minute too soon. Because, um, you know, the other thing was kind of not doing it for me anymore. You know, and that's another pattern. 
that my story definitely uh, resembles, you know. Um, so in the beginning, you know, the um, the effectiveness of the drink was pretty uh, pretty great, um, and there was no consequence to it. You know, I was in college in a relatively consequence-free environment. Even if we did get, you know, caught for underage drinking or for doing anything else illegal, we were protected by the university. Ultimately, was the buffer between us and the metro police, and you know, it happened on several occasions. And we did whatever, you know, slap in the hands, you know. And um, so, you know, I did a cost-benefit analysis, and and the result of that was drink as much as possible, as frequently as possible. Um, that kind of logic made sense to me. It's about senior year of college where, um, so subsequently still doing this whole relationship thing, um, you know, and um, that didn't go too well my senior year. Um, junior year, I spent the entire time in Eastern Europe, and, and um and she had spent it somewhere else, and we came back and found that in that year, you know, some things had happened, and, and it wasn't working out for us. And um, I don't know why her, and I don't know why this particular moment, but I was completely unable to accept it. Um, I found myself at a psychiatrist's office, and, um, you know, I needed to calm down, you know. And, um, you know, scripts were written, things were taken, and... Um, you know, and I found, I found some escape. You know, that was an interesting part of my life because, um, you know, I wasn't eating and I wasn't sleeping and people would come up to me and they would say, man, you look great. And, <laughs> and um, you know, and that was another, um, another thing that I think about a lot now in recovery about, about things not being what they seem. And because um, I think it's very interesting how in the time of my life that was the absolute worst, what are the times that people would come up and say, man, you you just look great. What are you doing with yourself? You know, and so, well, last night I spent from 930 at night until about four in the morning pacing and then, you know, I was able to get maybe 30, uh, 30 minutes of sleep before, you know, I nervously woke myself back up Um you know, and then, you know, you guys get the point. I was a little high strung. <laughs> so, college ended and um, moved to Los Angeles because I was going to be in the entertainment industry. Um, in the book, it talks about how we are fairly, um, I think, just reasonable people in all aspects other than the drink. I'm paraphrasing. You know, and we're able to pull some things off um, when, we're, when we're not drinking. And, um, you know, and, you know, I think that once again that I, I resemble that statement, you know. Uh, looking back, I was able to do things that outside be difficult. And um, I, know I was able to pull off some things. I, you know, I went to L.A. I didn't have a job. I knew I wanted to work in the entertainment industry. And within a couple of months, I got myself you know, a job at um, one of the larger um, in the, uh, entertainment industry uh, agencies. Um, and um, in the mailroom there, just like everybody starts. And um, you know, it's just like the movie. And, uh, you know, within uh, about six months, I found myself at a, de- a desk of a motion picture talent agent. And, um, you know, and I was doing the deal. Um, now, how did I get that job? You know, I got the job by meeting the girl at the party you know, who wasn't necessarily somebody that was my my tape, you know, but, um, you know, she had an in and, you know, that was okay with me. You know, I didn't, I didn't have an internal set of you know, standards that would say, hey, maybe using people to get what you want isn't okay. You know, as long as I got what I wanted, then it was okay. And uh, once again, I had, I had no reason not to believe that. Because if I got what I wanted, I'd be happy. Right? Um, 
So did that gig, um, you know, a lot of stress. Um, basically, after a year and a half or so, realized, um, you know, this this isn't this isn't doing it for me. Um, by that time, I was drinking about a bottle of wine a night, and um, it was becoming, I think, more of of a medical. Thing. You know, like I was using it to medicate. At the same time, I was on the tranquilizers from the gig senior year of college, um, you know, which the book talks specifically about how we get to that point too. You know, and I would have to take those in order to be able to not be a little bit jittery in the morning. And there's, if you would have told me at that point that I was in the beginning of a road towards you know, absolute dependence on alcohol, I would have told you you're crazy because I'm just doing what normal 22 to 23, four year olds do, you know. Um, the next few years started a whole series of, um, of, of moves. You know, I'd gotten the, in the routine of getting fresh starts when I was, uh, when I was growing up and whether just as a force of habit or just the way the world works, I, I continued to do that pretty much every two years, um, up until this moment where I stand today, you know, I, I'm, I've pretty much moved every two years. And um, to Atlanta, then Denver, where I went to law school, um, then decided I didn't want to be a lawyer, which I should have decided before I went to law school. <laughs> and then um, back to Atlanta. And uh, I'm skipping a lot of the drama, guys, because um, I really want to get to the part that I want to talk about, especially to to you guys, specifically in this town. Um you know, during these years, you know, I did a lot of drinking. I hurt a lot of people. And I went with the idea that if I get what I want, then I'm going to be happy. And I chased it um, until there was no one left. Um, it says that selfishness is the nature. You know, it's selfishness, self-centeredness. You know, that is this disease. And um, whether there is or isn't, I do know that at that point in my life, you know, I, I, have, I have lived the life of a complete maniac, um, driven 100% by getting what I think I deserve. And if I get yours and get to keep mine, then surely I'm going to be happy. Um... Well, you know, no surprise to you guys, it didn't work. I didn't find any happiness. Um, by 2011, I was in Detroit. Um, I was working. I found a job I liked. I found it something that I was good at and I liked it. And um, I was working for one of the large automobile manufacturers up there, working in supply chain design and just really um, reveling. And I was traveling um to Europe every other week, um, and just, you know, I got to build teams and I got to do some things that, that I was really enjoying. Unfortunately, by this point, I had also developed um, such a habit. Um, my, the level of physical dependence had gotten um, pretty ridiculous, and, um, and I couldn't turn it off. Um, this is the point where I wanted to stop, but I couldn't. I had what I was looking for in substance in my life, but I couldn't stop. And um, I didn't know what to do. Um, kind of skipped over the. So I'd gotten a DUI about a year before that. And I'd gone to treatment as a result of that right here outside of Huntsville at Bradford. And I um, actually met a couple people. They were in this room during that. That was in 2007. And um, you know, that was my first introduction to the ideas of recovery. And when I was there, they had told me things like, you know, giving me a relapse prevention plan. And, you know, we'd gone over my triggers 
and we had talked about some of the things that I need to do in order to to not, you know, have the need to drink any longer. And um, I'm sure they told me, but I don't remember it being that important that I go to go to meeting. <laughs> um, so needless to say, it didn't last long. And um, <laughs> it's important I say this. So by I, by the time I end up in tr- Detroit, you know, I I got um, I would have these these moments where it's you know one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning at the bar, you know, and all of a sudden something like you know something that somebody would have said, actually somebody that's sitting in this room would have said. You know, at Bradford, you know, and that would pop in your head. You know, you're you're a, you know, a, a bottle into the night. You know, and all of a sudden, this, this stuff starts popping in your head. Like maybe there's another way. Maybe you don't have to do this. Maybe there are, are people out there that will help. Um. Those kind of temporary thoughts would pop in from time to time, but nothing that would have the hold that would actually get me, you know, to take any action. Um, but the disease did what the disease does, you know. It took me down. Um, eventually got to the point, even though I was making a significant amount of money, in order to keep going and drinking the way that I like to drink, I developed other habits. And um, very, very expensive habits. And I ran out of money. Um, I'd also run out of people to give me any money. And um, at a point of absolute desperation, I uh, stole a computer monitor from where I worked. And um, I sold it on the internet, took the money and got what I needed to get in order to drink the way that I wanted to drink, in order to just not be sick, so that I could go to work the next day, so that I could feel, so I could not feel like I, what I really was, which is, you know, a hopeless alcoholic. Um, I got caught. Um, several months later, I went into work, and you know corporate security and you know and that was that was the fall you know that was the um the pitiful incomprehensible demoralization you know why the your coworkers who you had just worked for years to make sure that they believed you were something you know and to have them watch you walk down that aisle, you know, and, and, and out of there is something I'll never forget. I had just enough money. Um, we got paid like that night, you know, so I had just enough money to buy a plane ticket to get to Nashville. Get to Nashville and my mother, the only person left in my life, would take me to a hospital. Um, and she took me to the hospital and I had, you know, like a month's left of insurance to get me um, back into Bradford. You know, I ended up doing, I think, I, did, I think, I know I went to treatment three times, and um, the first and the third time was at Bradford. I like to say I got my bachelor's at Bradford, my master's, and then my, my doctorate back at Bradford <laughs> in, uh, in recovery. And, um, you know, there were a couple things that happened there that that were different, and um, I'm really glad that part's over. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't like talking about that stuff. I don't, I don't know if I will. Um, I hear a lot of people get up and they tell these really funny stories about them ending up in different countries and saying, I just, if that happened to me. I've got, I've got stamps in my passport that I don't remember, but I, it scares the shit out of me. Um, so I ended up at Bradford and there's, a, there's a woman there who looks really familiar and she's a counselor. And um, I, I know many of you know her. And um, wow, she looks familiar. She still works here. Well, she didn't work there. She was a patient with me when I was in there the first time. 
and she had done um, what she heard them say, which I didn't hear them say, <laughs> you know, and she had done the deal. And now she worked as a counselor there. She still does. And, you know, that was my first 24 hours there was chewing on that for a second. So what have I been doing the last few years of my life? Because, see, here's the deal. It doesn't matter what I did, how great it possibly could have been. When I'm living that way, everything in my life is temporary. You know, when you drink the way that I drank and use people and things the way that I did, there is no such thing as building. You know, you're just you're just putting something together, you know, just so it can all fall apart the next time. You know, and so I found myself never really putting both feet in into anything because I just I knew it's all temporary because I knew I'm ultimately that me riddled with this, you know, obsession. You know, it's just a matter of time before it all comes tumbling down. And um, and that's the way I felt about life. And. um yeah, you know, thank God. I had nothing left. You know, like I said, I, I was born with everything. Every possible opportunity was available to me. And um, although I had, you know, several diplomas and all these different things that would, you know, that would tell an outsider, wow, he's got it together. You know, I had just gotten fired from a job for stealing a computer money. And luckily, no charges were filed just because the company I worked for didn't want the publicity. Um, so, end up in treatment, and we're doing that whole thing again, you know. And if you've ever been to treatment multiple times, you know, it's, it's just, it's really, um, it's really, um, it's really, uh, it's a mind fuck. I, I don't know how else to say it. You know, it's, it's both, um, Humiliating, well, it's, it's it's humiliating up until the point that you just say, you know what? <sighs> okay, here I am. What are we What are we going to do different this time? You know, and that was the greatest question I could have asked, by far. Because um, the truth is, in the past, the only thing I had ever done was exactly what I wanted to do, and it didn't work. And I was really tired. And I was really, really lonely. And I was really, the future wasn't looking so good. And um, somebody at treatment proposed to me that maybe I could start over, like entirely. Um, that maybe some of these ideas that I was using to live my life really weren't that good. Maybe they weren't serving me that well. And that's when I started getting introduced to all these other ideas of, um, of, of spirituality above and beyond, you know, my crippled belief system of, you know, of God and church. Um, I was just broken enough, had, you know, no other resources, so when they suggested that I go to live in... Um, a sober living home or a halfway house if you want to be a dick about it. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, that I, uh, that I had no other options. So, so I went. Um, and while I'm at, um, went to a place in Lebanon, Tennessee, um, you know, I got, I got the opportunity. So, um, the first day there, you know, I'm pretty sure they sold me on this. When I was in treatment, they sold me on this idea that you're going to go there and they're going to get you a job, and they're going to be, you know, meetings galore, and it's going to be like high school again or something, which for me wasn't that great. So they should have said college, but, uh, but no, I mean, I got there and they gave me like a piece of paper, and they gave me like some instructions on how to go get a job, you know, and of course, you know, I said. I know how to get a job. You know who I am? And, um, but if you would have looked at 
the ideas I would have come up with to get a job. And when I read those papers, you would have had two very, very different things. This this was, you know, go door to door, don't skip any place, don't choose where you want to work. Um, you know, as a manager, do these blah, 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 blah. Basically, don't use any of the tools that I knew how to use, which is people, you know, not all those different things. Uh, oh, and if you don't have a job in the next three days, then you don't live here anymore. You know, so um, you know, that was the beginning for me. That was the beginning of the road that I now, um, you know, I call recovery. You know, recovery from a hopeless state of mind and body. Recovery from a hopeless life that is lived in vain at all times. And incapable of building anything that's of substance because that was my life. But I took this piece of paper and I went out and I got myself a job in a restaurant and um and I would go to meetings. And I had to get a sponsor, you know, and um and I had to use the sponsor, which means at least I had to call him. And I got a sponsor. I got a sponsor by the name of Mark. And all these things in in you know in a grouping would you know, consider to be some of the most important things that have happened to me up until this point. Um, I was doing the sober living home thing and um, going to work in the restaurant, you know, dealing with things like you know my ego flaring up and um, you know I don't. I can't do this, you know. I can't, you know, continue to go to these meetings and listen to this same old stuff. It just sounded to me. It was just like, it was just repetitive and so quippy. And it's just, it was like a raw nerve. Um, you know, the levels of restlessness and irritability in my life were just, were just remarkable. After a few months of doing this, I was were way worse off, way worse off than when I had gotten there. And here I was, completely incapable of blaming it on alcohol or drugs because I didn't have any of them in my body. And I was, you know, pretty much back to the high school levels of damn near suicide. And... Um, you know, I've come to call this my sober bottom, and I've come to realize that many people have it. And it's for this reason that I have no problem relating to, say, like Clancy when he says that the natural state of a sober alcoholic is one of continuous anxiety, depression, and fear. You know, because once again, you take you take the um, you take the medications away from me. And I alone cannot handle all of this. You know, it's just too much. Um, so I got desperate enough to finally start being honest with Mark. So that at one day, when he asked me how I'm doing, instead of just saying, fine, I said, um, you know, I'm damn near suicide. And he said, you know, well, good. <laughs> that you may actually be at the jumping off point then. I want you to read and he, you know, basically had me reading up until the third step. He said, if you were really at that point, Holden, then I truly believe that you've worked step one and two. Did you realize you can't imagine life with alcohol and you, now there's no way you can imagine life without it. So, I want you to consider letting something else run your life. You know, and he had me think about that for about a week and um, you know, I I was very uncomfortable with the entire idea, you know, my life is shit, but at least it's my shit. You know, if I move forward, um, I was pretty convinced I was going to end up in China or working someplace. I, I was going to end up doing a whole lot of stuff that I didn't want to do. And I certainly didn't believe that any plan that God could come up with was better than mine. 
That's that's the you know the the root of my fear. And so I was sharing this with a friend yesterday. I I went to him and uh, about a week later he says, "So you're ready to do this?" And I said, uh, "No, he didn't say that. He said, do you want to do this?" And I said, "No, I don't." And he said, "Then I can't help you." And um, you know, scared the crap out of me because I thought, "Here I am, the ultimate loser, right? I'm I can't even do AA." You know, I've got a sponsor who's basically firing me. And, you know, and whether I liked your quippy little sayings or not, you A&A people actually looked pretty happy. I was convinced half of you were on something, but, but it was only because you were happy. Um, so I that whole vision just flashed in front of my eyes, and I thought, even that's going to get pulled away from me. So I said, look, I, I said I didn't want to do it. That doesn't mean that I'm not going to do it. And he said, good, then you're starting to get the point. It doesn't matter that you want to do it or not. It only matters that you do it. So we got down on the knees and we said the step prayer. You know, those two things by themselves are uncomfortable, but doing them together makes the whole thing just violently uncomfortable. <laughs> and then we get back up and he starts laughing. And I think we're having like this, this very sincere moment, you know, like it's uncomfortable, but like I'm pretty sure God is looking at only the two of us right now because we're doing this and he's laughing and, and it, it kind of pisses me off. <laughs> and, and he says probably the most important thing that anyone said to me in sobriety and something that continues to motivate me, uh, till this day in, in a very good way. I, I said, what's so funny? And he said, you don't want God to have that kind of control in your life, huh? I said, no. He said, well, that's too bad. He's got it anyway. He always has. He said, that little exercise we did is just to remind you who's God and who's the drunk. See, I always thought that just if I didn't recognize something or give it significance in my life, that it didn't apply to me. You know, that I could cheat and lie and do all these different things. And because I didn't believe in karma, because I didn't believe in right and wrong, because I didn't believe that there were laws and principles effect, that I was, you know, immune from the effects or the consequences of my actions. The truth is, they still applied whether or not I wanted to address them or not. That's a very big thing to me. Because I started to realize that the truth is there are forces at play. There are things out there in this world that are much bigger than me. And it was time to learn more about them so that maybe I could start to get on the right side of things. So that maybe I could have a better life. Or just a life, period. And that was the start of um, of like real sobriety for me. Uh, and I, I hate using these kind of terms. Let me just say that I've been I've been a pretty happy guy since. Um, it was pretty hot and heavy after that. Uh, we go right into four. I had fifth step experience um, to the best of my ability. You know, went through all the different columns, went through all three lists, um, and then made it a separate fourth list of um, the people who didn't fit on the first three lists who maybe I had wronged in some way, shape, or form. And, you know, um, it's been a couple months on six and seven. At this time, I'm starting to go to a lot more of the YPA events. That was when I went to my first Tiki Pod at six months. I'm starting to travel a little bit further away um, and starting to find my stride a little bit. You know, um, at this point, you know, the, 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 the physical sobriety, you know, has really taken hold. I'm starting to see um, some, some changes in my life. Um, just you know, internally, I'm starting to feel a lot better. But then I'm starting to also have um, things like um, friendships. And um, trying to like wrestle with what that's all about, you know, what what does it mean a friend, what does that mean? Um, and um, 
after about nine months of um, not drinking and not using and working a program, I was um, to the best of my ability, absolutely to the best of my ability, um, we, we got to um, back to those lists we had made. And, um, you know, everyone does this thing differently, right? So you got some people who are like first step for a year, guys, and you got some other people who are like, it's only been two weeks and they're on 12. And there's like, there's all these different groups. And uh, I guess we're somewhere in the middle. But, um, you know, it, you know, being at nine um, meant um, there was there was a lot of work to be done. Um, I found something um Temporarily at times, but it, it was happening more often, and that was like, um, you know, a freedom. I was finding that I wasn't drinking, I wasn't using, but I also wasn't scared of my own shadow. And I wasn't scared of you. You could come up to me in a meeting and I could look you in the eye. And you could say, how are you? And I could be honest with you. I found... Um, there were a lot of really good things that were happening in my life. Um, and I didn't want that to stop. And I was scared to death because I was listening to a lot of speakers and I was listening to a lot of tapes. And the thing I kept hearing over and over and over again was, you know, eight and a half doesn't do it. You know, I kept hearing that that nine is important. And... I had a note card, you know, for each amend that I owed. And I think there was 183 note cards in seven countries and several different states. Um, my job, I traveled internationally, so if I brought in the professional aspects of it, there were, there were a lot of people who I owed amends to. And the whole thing seemed just daunting. I didn't know if I was going to be able to do that. But, um, my sponsor, Mark, ever the practical one, um, was very, uh, very good at setting my priorities for me. And he broke up the note cards into a range where we pretty much went after the looming um, legal issues first, which to me were the scariest. Well, my very first amend actually was um, to a woman, my mom's next-door neighbor, a woman named... Um, I apologize, Linda, and Linda, um, Linda's husband, a few years back, had died of cancer, and shortly before his death, and he had been taken to the hospital, and I, you know, had taken his medication, not some of it, and um, there had been accusations. Somehow, I passed the drug test. I, I don't know how this worked. Long story short. My first amendment was to go back to her and say, I took medication from your dying husband. And I'm sorry. Is there anything that I can do today to make up for that? It was one of the hardest things I've ever done. And just like everything in this program to this point, the results were completely opposite of what I thought they would be. And she said, no, thank you. Thank you for telling me this. She said, I knew you did. And I knew you were in trouble, but I knew that was between you and God. And then she said, your mother is one of my best friends. And if you are sincere in your offer to do something for me, then you will stop hurting your mother. And on that note, I wouldn't mind hearing from you every once in a while, too. I had no idea that people out there actually wanted to hear from me every once in a while. You know? So, what I got was um, a friendship that was always just one-sided, right? And now it's an actual relationship. It's a friendship I still call into, um, you know, every week and see how she's doing. Um, 
The other amends that we're making, I uh, had, had a DUI, uh, like I said, back in Colorado that I eventually just stopped showing up for stuff on. And, um, you know, out, when I was out there, I just thought it would never catch up to me. And um, it was preventing me from getting my driver's license back in the state of Tennessee. And um, it was not just Colorado, but also District of Columbia. And so on two separate trips, I went both to Colorado and District of Columbia, um, both with six months hanging over my head. And on both occasions, they said, um, I had a letter from the house as well as, um, on one instance, my sponsor with me. And they both said, we don't want, we just want you to keep doing what you're doing. And, um, you know, I see so many people who come in who have even less time than I do who, who are, that, that fear of going back to the authorities or that fear of the looming, um, legal stuff basically just drives them right back out. You know, it, it's, it's too hard. It's never going to be resolved in a way that I'm going to be okay with. So there's no sense in me even trying to do this, right? Well, my case says the exact opposite. You know, what I learned through going through these approaches was that whereas I always was one to want to manipulate and con because I didn't think that if I did things just the right way, the result would be okay, in my favor, aka. Um, what I found is, by going on these approaches and putting myself out there, as scary as it may be, the people who are in the position to make the decisions and judge my fate did so in a way that was, you know, kind. And it certainly wasn't just, because if it was just, I'd still be in prison or jail or whatever. So, you know, I, I got a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, forgiveness and, and kindness that I really didn't deserve. Um, it's been a really, really cool experience. Um, I still have, um, I don't know, 65 note cards left. Um, a lot of financial amends that are still out there. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, I've made every financial amend approach and set up something like the book tells us to that, that I know of. So what do I get as a result of that? Um, after about a year sober, um, I met someone uh, in a meeting who um, just happened to work in the same industry that I used to work in, who just happened to have a good friend and colleague who just happened to be looking for somebody who did exactly what I used to do. And whereas you guys told me when I came into this program, you said, if you just do this, you'll get all your stuff back. And I say, well, I can legitimately say how after maybe four or five years, that might be able to work. Well, I remember sitting there at my desk, like 15 months sober, and I had it all back. Uh, the driver's license. I had the job with a raise. Um, with the better company with, um, you know, talking to my brother again, talking, you know, to my mother again, talking to my grandparents again. Um, you know, how undeserving am I for the gifts that, that you guys showed me, you know, how to make myself available for. And, um, you know, the the level of work that I put into this is so minuscule um, compared to the gifts that I get. And um, the reason that this group in particular um, and this afternoon in particular is so meaningful to me personally and maybe the reason why normally I'm actually pretty lighthearted uh, or have been recently at least. Um, but this is very... Um, this is very meaningful to me because, you know, when I got sober um, at Bradford that time and I was so scared, there were people that were in this room, you know, who were who were in that building who who basically gave me gave me the strength to to make some hard decisions, you know, to learn um, not to trust myself, you know, just to say I don't, I will do what you tell me to do, not tell me what to do, you know, to trust that. 
and um, and I made a promise when I left Bradford that um, that I'd come back um, and then I would you know um, try to get back in this area specifically and um, and this is the um, this is the you know I saw Leifa, met him you know, a few months ago and then just saw him just a couple weeks ago and and then and once again you know I I didn't plan all this it just it just happened. And I'm just, I'm really, I'm having a remarkable life as a result of, um, of just doing, um, just doing not much, you know, <laughs> doing as little planning and as little manipulation as possible. Um, I don't want you guys to get me wrong, like, um, this stuff isn't easy for me. It, it, it's, it does, it's not that it takes a lot of work, but it, it, this stuff isn't natural to me, right? I told you earlier how, like, I, naturally, I am a dis, dishonest, manipulative person. I didn't choose that. I don't, and I believe that. I believe that I didn't choose that. At some point, I just said, this is, this is it. This is easier, or this is, I don't know. I think it comes back down to the selfishness, but this, this gig that you guys introduced me to of being of service and of helping others and of, um, of being honest, above all, just be honest. But that's not easy for me, and I don't know why. You know, but now I'm a member of a fellowship where I can literally come back 30 seconds after I've said something and say, "Hey, I just lied to you." <laughs> and around here, that's just business as normal. <laughs> you know. And thank God for that, because, you know, I spend 40 to 50 hours a week at a place where if I was to do that just once, I'd be asked to leave. And I look at them every day and say, if you guys just knew who your boss is, it's me. (laughs) And if you guys just knew, you know, all the stuff I have to hold y'all, you know? And um, I don't know. Like I said, um, I just it's it's very weird. Recovery is very weird. Being sober is very weird. You know, it's the best word for it for me. It's a very weird experience. You know, um, there's a lot of weird things going on. There's a lot of weird people, and I've <laughs> and I've got a I've got a lot of weird feelings that I don't. You know, I don't even know how to name them, much less deal with them. And, um, you know, at this point, this is all I know how to do. You know, it's, um, it's just, you know, it's this, and it's pretty simple for me, you know. Um, I got one other thing to say, and then I'm, I'm literally going to go so grateful, um, for you guys. Really, um, this has just been the coolest experience. I, um, now, I was joking around about how I'd been through treatment a couple times and maybe gone to a few meetings. I'd never really heard the message. And I um, I really, um, I believe one thing now from the bottom of my heart. And um, that is that whether it was said or not, you know, I do know for a fact that that I was led at times by this idea that just going to meetings and, um, you know, just not drinking no matter what, um, that I was going to be okay. So that when I, whether it's a couple months later, was not okay, I just thought it was never going to work. And um, the coolest thing about this thing, and the reason why I believe I'm not just, you know, plain sober, but I'm happy, is because... When I went to the meeting out of treatment, what I was told very specifically was that um, you know the meetings aren't going to keep me safe, and that if I identify as an alcoholic the way that this book says, that um, you know it's not good news. It really isn't, and I don't hear this talked about a lot. But it's really, it's pretty much a death sentence. 
And so what I was told is, if you identify with this, if you can only do for yourself, that's what they were telling me, then then these are the things that you're going to have to do. Um, and then, you know, you're going to turn around and you're going to give it to somebody else, you know, and you're going to do it until you love it because you're going to do it the rest of your life. You know, that wasn't the easy thing for them to tell me. I had a bit of an attitude at the time, and and I know I wasn't a joy to be around. But you know, they didn't care. They told me anyway, and they told me enough repetitively that I ended up just doing it, if for no other reason than to shut them up. And I found, as a result, um, that you know, I found some freedom from my selfishness. You know. It really was the selfishness that was driving the whole thing. And it, and I do believe that sobriety now, the only difference, you know, the reason why I do not have to wrestle today with the desire to drink and use is because, you know, my mind is slowly being changed um, into something that is not as selfish, you know. But it takes work. For me, it takes a lot of a lot of conscious thought and I have to stay really close to my sponsor to ensure that all of a sudden I'm not thinking like God, because I'll get there too, you know. But you guys will, um, you guys help me every day, and um, you know, I truly can't do any of this without any, without you guys. And I really um, appreciate y'all letting me share. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.